We're going to get going in a, a few seconds, but um, if you had a drink with me this week, um, you're welcome to sit in the front row. I have some spots saved, so you two can come up. You can come up if you want. It's up to you. <clears throat> What's that? Are there That's for you, Troy. You're sitting up front. It helps me to have a familiar face. I appreciate it. Yep. All right, we're live. Um, Troy, throw the t-shirts up on the stage here. Soon. Or just take them, I don't know. Hey, everybody, um, really excited to be here. This is, it's, um, let me switch to the slides. So uh, welcome to the talk, Simplify and Optimize YAML with YAML Script. Um, <clears throat> I've given a few talks on this this year, and this is by far, this is YAMLCon to me. Um, I've never seen so much YAML in one place. So. Um, let's see if we can. Let's see. Thanks, Troy. This is Troy. <clears throat> All right, so I'm wearing a shirt that says, uh, let's talk about YAML. It didn't really work. Nobody came up and talked to me about YAML. I had to go talk to them, but I had some great conversations with some of you this week, and it was, it was fantastic. Um, but right now, I want to see if we can sing about YAML and just do this for me, all right? I mean, if, if you use YAML and you appreciate it that it was made, uh, sing out with me. So I'm going to, I wrote a, a program that will print the words so you can follow along, but that's, that's way too much YAML, right? You know, too much tuna, it's just too much YAML. Okay, so oh, that's better. All right. Three charts of YAML to install. Three charts of YAML. Don't be overwhelmed. Install one with Helm. Two charts of YAML to install. Everybody. Two charts of YAML to install. Two charts of YAML. Don't feel overwhelmed. Install one with Helm. One chart of YAML to install. One chart of YAML to install. One chart of YAML. Don't feel overwhelmed. Install one with Helm. No more charts of YAML to install. All right. Thank you. All right, I start every talk like that, so that's just that's what I do. Um, All right, so a little bit about this tutorial. Um, I don't know if you caught the QR code on the top. That this is the URL that all the information is at, including these slides. If you want to blast forward and see what you're going to learn, that's fine with me. Um, I don't use Kubernetes day to day, um, but I've been around it since 2015, um, a place where Troy and I actually worked back then, um, started using it then. I actually interviewed for a job with one of the creators of, uh, of Kubernetes in Seattle is a short-lived startup, and um, they weren't interested, and I wasn't. I just wanted to help them with YAML, you know? And, uh, and then I got home, and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's their revenue stream, the, the, the case on it. So that, that's what I imagine. Um, yeah, so. Uh, but I want to teach you some stuff about YAML and YAML script today, and for Kubernetes and for um, other stuff, it's general purpose. And I expect you to figure out cool stuff to do with it and get back to me about that. Um, and we can work together to make this great if you like it. <clears throat> also, this is, all these slides are in Vim, if you were wondering. Um, and I wrote something in 2008 called Vroom. And I do all my slideshows in it. So it's, uh, I like it. Um, <clears throat> there's going to be live coding. It's not going to be a smooth, clean talk like the Helm 4 one I saw last night, so polished. Was, Matt's a really great speaker. Um, but hopefully it'll be interesting. And I have a few t-shirts. I didn't really expect that it was going to be so, such a big audience. Um, so I'm not sure how I'm going to get t-shirts, but if you really want one, I got small, medium, large, and an extra large, I think, and maybe, maybe five. I don't know. We'll work it out. Uh, if something comes to mind, Troy, then. OK. So I'm Ingi.net. It's my name. And I invented YAML, the, the YAML data language. 
Uh, back, starting back in 2001, um, people, a few people asked me how it started, and it was basically I made a Perl module that dumped data that looked kind of Python-y, and Clark and Oren, Clark Evans and Oren Benkiki were trying to fix XML, because in 2001, everything was XML, and it looked like it was going to be, and they're like, this is not good. So um, somebody saw the mailing list that they were on in my module and wrote an introduction thing. You guys should talk to each other. We talked to each other. I called Clark, and we talked for four hours, and I was hooked. I just said, yeah, I couldn't stop saying YAML <laughs> for the first few months. YAML, YAML, YAML. Um, yeah, so I think we got the first spec out in 2005. A JSON comes up a lot. Um, you know, like JSON came first and we came after, but now that they both actually started in 2001 and then kind of got known by each other in 2005 or six. And we looked at the YAML then and we said, oh, this is like our flow style. Is it exactly a subset? And it wasn't. There's three things that were slightly off, so we fixed the three things and now it's 100% a subset. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so then I stayed with it. Those guys went to do other things. And over time, I picked up a crew of um, Tina Mueller, uh, Pantelis, Antonio, Emily Eros, and Tom Smith. And um, a couple years ago, we put together a new revised spec of non-normative changes. Um, but we talked this, this next year. It's likely that we're going to start working on YAML 1.3, which will have normative changes. Um, I've taken the last 18 months to create YAML script. Uh, some stuff just came together, and I've been trying to solve the problems of YAML ever since the 2009, 10 area. Just you know, when people started doing stuff with it, I'm like, oh, we, we should fix it up. So this really hit the head and nail on the head, and. So I'm like, I need to take time off and just make this thing, and I have. Um, it's a complete programming language, and it solves a lot of the problems that people try to solve uh, with YAML, but it solves them for everyone, so. Um, yep. And I'm going to be asking for questions. Um, in the back, so how should we do questions? Is the, are the mics live, sir, in the back? AV? Are the question mics live? OK. Um, so if you see, if, if I'm going on for a while and, and you have a question and you want to ask it, you can line up at the mic. Um, I'll probably only take one or two questions per, per topic. Um, and if you yell them out, I'll just repeat them so people can hear them so, for the recording. OK, so introducing YAML script. Um, <clears throat> so it's a completely YAML-based syntax. Um, let's, let's take a look at that program that I ran that printed uh, the, the 99 charts. So there it is. Um, the first line, if you want to have any code execution in your YAML, you add this tag at the top. Here we define a function main that gets caught automatically with an optional parameter number, uh, defaults to 99. Here's a doc string describing that function optional. Um, here's a f uh, each loop that will go through the range of numbers backwards. Here's a what would be kind of a here document, the literal scalar type in, in YAML, and, but it, it supports interpolation um, when it's treated as code. And, so, and it also can call functions or just interpolate variables. Um, and here, we need the English representation of 0, 1, and you know, the, the pluralization and that kind of thing. So um, within the template type of thing here, we, we call out to that. It's pretty obvious, I think. Um, so it's a real language because it transpiles to a language closure. How many people know of closure? It's, a, it's um, <clears throat> it was written about 15 years ago by Rich Hickey and solves a lot of the problems with Java nicely in a Lisp format. It's a JVM language, but YAML script itself, comp there's a thing um, from Oracle called GraalVM that can take Java stuff and compile to native binary. So you'll never, you don't need any JVM, you don't have to no Java at all. I, don't, I rarely used any Java making this. Sometimes I'd look at some deep stuff a little bit, but I'm not a Java guy, so. Um, and you don't have to be. It's just, you know, just a single binary. Uh, one place you might see it bleed through is if you have a stack trace. So up here, we, we divide it by zero. And down at the, on the last line, you can see there's a, a, a Java message. It's because it was compiled in 
to there, so it's going to show up. Um, at some point, the error system will be rewritten, so it'll just kind of give you an error message that's more useful to you. The binary interpreter is called binary interpreter is called YS. I pronounce it Ys sometimes, and I have a GitHub org now called Cubewise, Cube. YS and Helmwise is one of the major topics that I'll be showing you um, using YAML script in, in Helm. Um, are there any questions? Take one or two. All good? All right. Um, who knows of Rosetta code? Not that many people. This has been around since 2007. It's a, it's a media wiki wiki that has, no kidding, 950 plus programming languages and 1,300 tasks. It's got about usually between 10 to 12% completion of the, of, of the matrix. And people just can, you, anybody can edit it and contribute stuff. So YAML script has some stuff on there. Mm -hmm. So we can just, I have a handful of programs, 10 or 15 um, so far, but you could add more. But one thing I did about 12 years ago, actually, was I, I scraped the entire site, and I have a scraper that will put it all, all of the code samples into a GitHub repo so you can clone them in a few seconds. It's a massive repo, so it might take four seconds, you know, but um, you can, it's, uh, it's under the Acmeism org, which is don't ask, and it's called Rosetta Code Data. And all of this will be pointed to in the, the, the main URL that I showed you earlier. So. The slide URL. <clears throat> Any questions on Rosetta? Don't suspect so. OK. So programming in YAML script, we'll start with that. And so actually, everybody knows what FizzBuzz is, right? But just in case you don't, let's ask uh, YAML LLM <laughs> what it is. OK. So it's a classic programming challenge, blah, blah, blah. It prints out the numbers 1 through 100, and sometimes Fizz, sometimes Buzz. There you go. So YAML LLM is a, a YAML script program that queries LLMs. It queries a bunch of them. Those are the ones, um, Anthropic, OpenAI, and uh, Google's Gemma stuff. And you can draw pictures with the DALI stuff and stuff like that. So I kind of quit my subscription to ChatGPT, and I just use YAML LLM now. Um, <clears throat> so let's have it do FizzBuzz and YAML script for us, because YAML LLMs are so cool, right? That's not, let's try again. OK, there's a code example up at the top. That's absolutely 100% not YAML script, I can tell you. Uh, but I love how it tries. I love how it tries. OK, let's look at a real FizzBuzz and YAML script. So, you know, you've seen shorter, you've seen longer, um, but it's not bad. Fairly readable, and let's run it. It does its thing, um, and you can add a parameter in there and just go up to 16. Just... So how does this compare to other programming languages? Uh, let's take a look. So I wrote another YAML script program that would take um, a bunch of languages and it would show the YAML script version. And then it would show who, what, what's, a, what's the Kubernetes programming language of choice? It's Cold Fusion, yeah? There's Cold Fusion, all right. Uh, let's, I, I've, I've heard Go a little bit, so let's take a look. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not saying it's YAML script's better or worse or anything like that. I'm just saying it's. It's in the ballpark, right? It's, and it actually shows up um, in the examples I've seen as among the clearest and, and most concise languages. So, and it you know, can do any task. So, <clears throat> oops, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Are there questions on that? So FizzBuzz is a toy program, but the comparison thing was a real program. It parsed command line 
arguments. It read environment variables. It had a config file that it parsed and read. Um, defines and uses functions and variables. Reads files from disk. Um, <clears throat> uses data structures. Formatted markdown. It downloaded data files from the web. It read, Controls. reads and writes JSON, and it posted to the GitHub API that final thing that gave us a URL. So let's take a look at this guy. So it's 250 lines, but you know it's you can see that it's doing a lot of stuff. Here's the the API stuff. The first, the second line is kind of interesting because this makes it both valid Bash and valid YAML script. So you can actually run this with Bash if you don't have YAML script on your computer, and then it will install in slash temp a copy of the binary YAML script and run the thing with it the first time. So that's interesting. We'll do that in a second. Um, so we have main function, you know, so the, the, the markdown, I always use the, the here document, kind of the, um, the literal style thing with interpolation works out nicely uh, for formatting bodies of text and that kind of thing. So, and we can run it with YAML script or we can run it with bash. So there you go. Um, trust me, they look the same. <laughs> um, any questions so far? Uh, yeah. Okay. Who uses Bash at all, and who knows about the minus X option for running Bash scripts? Cool. All right. So um, minus X for Bash will print every command and its arguments before it evaluates it. Um, I was thinking it would be cool. It kind of dawned on me one day that I could do this for YAML script, and I did. So uh, let's take a look. Um, that Rosetta code thing that I wrote has a, a giant um, file of languages and their extensions that it uses. And one thing I wrote recently was uh, something that will find all the new languages that have been added that are not in this config file. So um, it's just a little bash script like this. And let's run it. So Contolo, anybody use Contolo or Tav? No? OK. So uh, let's run it with the minus x and see what it looks like. OK. Um, yeah, so it gave Contolo and Tav at the back, b bottom, but it printed everything that it, every line that it executed. Um, let's look at that. Let's do the FizzBuzz comparison program with the minus X flag in YAML script and see what that looks like. So that was 12,000 statements with, you can see the function and the arguments that were passed in. And um, it's really good for when you're debugging something and it just blows up. And you can actually just set an environment variable if, if it's not a program that you would run with YS, if it's like in your path somewhere. You can just set um, ys underscore x trace to one to non nil value. Okay. So, but the main goal of YAML script, at least so far, I mean, I use it for programming, but I don't imagine a lot of you came here to learn that. So, um, is that it improves YAML? And I, who uses YAML in their programming day to day, or you know, in their jobs? Yeah, pretty much everyone. So, I suspect that's why you're here. Um, <clears throat> YAML script does the things that people bolt onto YAML um, in a clean way, and it doesn't, it's, you know, can be used by anyone for anything. Um, <clears throat> it comes with batteries included, so it just has a lot of libraries baked into it um, that, like the core, there's over a thousand standard functions. I, I, I don't know the count, but, um, and we'll look a little bit more later at, at the standard libraries that are in there. Notice my app. <clears throat> Troy, can you bring me my phone? It's right there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, they have a clock up here that says 90 minutes on it, and I, sus I suspect that I have less than that now. So I want to. Keep an eye on that. Thank you. OK, thank you. <clears throat> All 
Yeah, so one of the things I decided early on in making YAML script is that all YAML config files that you guys use that are valid YAML should be valid YAML script. Um, and unless you put that special tag that I showed you up there before, it would load the same. Um, so, so you could use it YAML script as a translator or you know, as, as for pulling out data out of, out of data files and that kind of thing uh, without having to add anything to those files. <coughs> um, and that means that since we said JSON is a subset of YAML, and who believes that J who doesn't believe that JSON is a full subset of YAML? It's got to be. You know, none of you are on Hacker News. Online, you're going to like, I know some of you are going to say that. Because, <laughs> yeah, we got jumped on a couple of years ago, and there's like, well, what about this? Like something deep about Unicode. And like, so we're like, all right, gang, you know, the five of us got together and it's like, let's check. It could maybe somebody found something. Somebody found once, the first one was when they, a uh, JSON file that starts with a tab. We're like, oh, yeah, that's probably not valid YAML. But then we looked in the spec and no, it's. Um, indentation doesn't start until content starts. And so that tab isn't indentation. It's just pre white space, according to the productions in the spec. So <clears throat> anyway, I'm hoping that YAML script can improve uh, Kubernetes Helm, customize, and anything else that you guys use today to day, even if it's not Kubernetes specific. And it would be really great if you do start using it to let me want, know what you're doing, because I'd like to see it and make it better if I can. OK, so this summer, I spent the, <laughs> I was talking about conference-driven conference development last night. The guy I, I told never heard of it, but I thought that was just a thing. Who's heard of conference-driven development? Anybody's spoken it, I would imagine. So. Um, the summer was exorcism-driven development, and exorcism.org is a site. Has anybody heard of it or used it? Uh, it's a language learning site. It's open source. It's free. And I, at one of the conferences I was at, somebody was giving a talk on, um, they were the maintainer of exorcism for Perl, and I was like, oh, can I get my language added to that? And, you know, they, he added me to a discussion, and then they're like, yeah, sure, and then it took about two months of work. It was a lot of work. But... If you go to exorcism.org, there's 74 languages, and YAML script is the latest one. So there it is. <clears throat> um, it's cool, because there's 60 exercises that you get, and um, you, can, you can get real live mentors to help you become better at it. So, um, and I would ask you, if you become really good at it, and you like it, um, become a mentor yourself. Any questions on any of exorcism or any of it? No. I do have a question. Oh, <laughs> um, I'm just curious, more generally speaking, uh, what are some challenges you faced de uh, developing YAML script? And like, what are some things when you were developing it that you wanted to make sure was better than other languages? That's a good, good question. Um, <clears throat> so I'm like, really picky. Like, when I first started doing this, I was, I'm like, mate, can you make a language out of YAML? And I, I, I was working on a, a Lisp thing where you could um, d develop your own Lisp in like two weeks or something. It's, it's, it's called MAL. It's on GitHub. And we still apply the resource code on that. And after, like, we, we, uh, after we have. What's going on? <laughs> OK. Um, yeah, so I started playing around with it, and I'm like, well, that's not looking good. So then I I'm like, oh, but I could do this. And pretty soon I'm like, oh, this, this could work. And, you know, so you get the first revision done, and then but you look at, you, you write a program in it, and you're like, oh, these, that, it works, but these things just don't fly with me. You know, I'm kind of a, yeah. I want stuff to be really clean. So, um, yeah, I just, basically writing code in it is one of the major, major drivers in it. And... I added features to YAML script 0 0.184 that shipped last night at 3 in the morning. Um, in the last few days, writing this talk, I'm like, eh, this, this needs to be a little bit better. So, yeah. You bet. And I, so I had in the slide earlier, you, you've seen v0 a few times. Uh, v0 will be s declared stable with no backwards incompatible breakage um, by the end of the year. And then 
version one will go forward with, uh, with breaking changes. I, that's why I kind of set it up that way um, so that any YAML script that you write after v0 is stable in v0 will work forever, hopefully. Um, yeah. Who uses the merge key in YAML or knows what that is? Uh, I don't use it too much, but um, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to go. This is a story about YAML and the merge key, a tale from Copilot's favorites. Once upon a time in the land of YAML, there was a key named Lessy Less, and it was called the merge key. It was the only function in YAML 1.1. It was used to merge mappings, and it was very powerful. I, just, I, I write my slides with, with uh, Copilot, and it's just started doing that, and I'm like, I'll, I'll go with it. So. Um, but it, it's. If you use an unquoted less than, less than, in some implementations, and I think it Go YAML supports it, is that, is that right? Can somebody verify that? No? OK. Um, then whatever that points, so usually you, you point it to an alias, and it will take the rest of the mapping and merge that aliased mapping together. And people use it a lot. We actually. Defining YAML was kind of a weird process because we'd just argue over things and we'd kind of trade and we never agreed on anything. So we'd kind of use features and <laughs> elements as bargaining chips and you know it, it got pretty good but some things got left in that maybe shouldn't have and um, after 1.1 went out we go, you know this is not, this is a data language, we don't really need a function in there. Um, but people love it and they want more functions for, for arrays and all, stuff like that. So. Um, a lot of implementations, even when they went to 1.2, they still stick with the merge key because it's, it's used, and that's fair. Um, YAML script also supports the merge key, and we'll take a look at that, but the whole point of YAML script was to add thousands of functions to YAML to do anything, read a database, pull data from the web, transform things, reverse things, whatever, um, replicate things, make random data, right? Uh, and merge was just one of these thousand functions. So let's take a look at this. Um, okay, and I assume people can read this okay? Yeah. If you can't, move forward, please. And um, so this is a typical thing. People will have a default uh, mapping pair, and then they'll put some anchors on things that they want to use again in the document. And then down here, they'll say, okay, I have this map with this pair, key three, val three, but I want to merge in these other two mappings. And so... If we run this through ys minus y, which we'll print it out in YAML, that's what it does. But look, we still have the defaults in there, and that's not really what we wanted. We wanted a data source to use, but we really didn't want that as part of our final model. So um, people can do things to pull that out, like um, you could use JQ, or you could use um, YAML script here, where you just add a minus E, dissociate, which just pulls a key out of a, a mapping. And so now we got the defaults rid of that. It's not the best way to work with things. So let's look at some other ways you can do with, with um, the merge key. So here, and this only would work in YAML script, you can, first we have a mapping. We have two documents in this YAML stream. And this one does the, the definition of our data sources. And since YAML script by default will only return the last document's value, then it will pull in that data, but it won't actually show this data in the final result. Does that make sense? So let's see if it works. And it gives us the same thing. So we go to the next one. Or we can just, that was a few anchors. So instead of just, in YAML script, instead of anchoring everything, we can just put one anchor on the, on the document. And then look at these aliases. Now, th these aren't, this guy right here that's a valid YAML, and everything has to be valid YAML, but since it's in a code area, since we have the special tag, I can treat it differently, and so I treat it as this anchor with, um, I call it dot, dot chaining, or, or you know, um, path lookups off of it. So we're, we're, we're taking the whole thing and say, okay, we'll take um, mapping zero and mapping one. Great. And all of these things work the same. 
Or we can get rid of anchors altogether, and there's a special, as of a few days, as of this release, there's the plus, plus, plus thing that refers to the whole YAML stream so far. So if you had 10 documents in the stream, you'd have access to a vector or array of nine things here, and that you can pull stuff, data out of them. OK? So, and zero is the first one, and dollar in this case is the same as zero, but it's the last one of, of the, the previous things in the array. You can't access the same one um, yet. And run it, blah. OK. Oops, sorry. Just one more. And here, I kind of took those two things out of an array, and I put them back into an array. So why not just use the whole previous document there, right? I mean, that, this just works out in this case. Um, so I just pulled the last document out of the stream, and that's what my merge key is, an array of mappings. Um, and instead of saying slash data at the end, you can just put a colon at the end. And it's just shorthand for, for the, that tag. And that still works. OK, so now let's quit using the merge key and do the same thing with the YAML script functions. OK. So the secret sauce down here is the merge function. And why is this a function and not a text string? Like, this is just the, the string database, but this is a function. It's because of this double colon that said, and we'll learn about this in the next slides. Here, this is data mode. This is data mode, um, because the colon started us that way. But we need to switch over, just for the next node, uh, to code mode. And so this is merge this. And then let's switch back to data mode, because we just want these to be strings. Same thing. And I realized, what if that was a massive mapping that we wanted to merge? We'd have to indent the whole thing over. If you saw, I, I inserted another level of indentation. And now we have a huge diff in our, our files. That's not going to fly. Um, and being a perfectionist, um, I'm like, well, we could use tags. And what this tag means is merge takes not an array of things, but it actually takes several arguments. So uh, you know, if you, you want to merge three things, you have three arguments. And so this key says, use on this node below, Pipe it into the merge function, but splat the arguments on the way in. And here we have two interesting things. We have a, a dot greater than and a, and a colon debug. These actually do the same thing. Um, one's just short for the other. But let's see what happens when I run this. So it actually printed debugging data as it was doing this, because all of this compiles to a program and is actually run to produce the data. Um, so I can do debugging in, in that. Um. And one more. <clears throat> this one doesn't work yet. <laughs> but um, yeah, we could pass arguments into the tag with parentheses. And so we wouldn't even have had to put that thing down here. Now it's super clean. Um, and that, and one of the next couple of re by the end of the year, that should be doable. And also, you can chain these methods together. So I could say merge, I don't know, reverse, uh, remove a key, add a key, that kind of thing, all in one long tag chain. And we got an error, because that's an invalid tag at the moment. So let's start and look at where we started and where we ended up. So this is the old way to do it, that you do it today, and not great, because you still have the defaults in it. This is the, the new way on the right-hand side. So I think that's pretty good. What do you guys think? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Yeah. Wow, thank you. I didn't think I, I thought I'd just get like a couple thumbs up. Thank you. So, well, if you like that, the better stuff's coming. Um, so let's look at modes that I just talked about, swapping between data mode and code mode. YAML actually has, well, first. Right, we talked about the say hello down here. Are those strings or are those variables? Is that a function? We don't really know until, unless we know the mode that it's in. Um, yep. 
So each node, which is like, you know, a, a mapping as a whole or an, a, uh, a sequence as a whole is, is a node, but then it has subnodes. Um, you know, it's each, each and um, what do they call it? Leaf of the graph? Or no, no. I'm not good at graph theory, so I don't know the words. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so YAML has three modes, and we saw data mode and code mode, but there's also bear mode, which if you don't have any tag at the top, that's just a YAML document that you have on your disk. They're all in bear mode now until you start adding um, a special tag to it. And then, then you go into either code mode or data mode, and then you uh, flip back and forth. So um, to start a YAML document, if you start it with nothing, it's in bear mode. Um, you can use this tag at the beginning, and this is at the top of a document, right? Not necessarily at the top of the string, but every document has to declare what mode it starts in. Um, that's data mode. This is the longer form of code mode, the longer form of data mode. And you can actually say bare mode if you wanted to. I don't know why you would. And if you have a hash bang at the top, and it has to use ys minus zero so that your program will still work after we start shipping YAML script one, right? Um, then it will start in code mode. Now, once you're in the code, you can flip back and forth by putting a single bang tag in front of any node, and that will switch between data and code mode. And if it sounds complicated, it's really not. It's pretty obvious what mode you're in by looking at it, and it's pretty easy when something goes wrong to figure out, oh, I was in the wrong mode there. Um, but, and then there's a shortcut. If you're in a mapping pair, if you say foo colon bar and you want to say, in bar, you want bar to be a variable, you would say, you could either say foo colon bang bar or foo, foo double colon bar. And the double colon just looks a lot nicer. Um, and there's these long forms if you really want to be, if you're in a tricky part of the code and you just really want to declare this needs to be code or data or bare mode. And actually, if you switch to bare mode, that whole thing is locked down. You can't switch out of it, right? So let's look at a program here. So this is a, a multi-doc program. And in this top one, we just define a map and we give it an anchor. And so we're defining data sources. Here, we're defining a function called double, um, which will multiply a number by two. Here, hi. Keep going, keep going. Yeah, no problem. I'm okay. just grabbing a water can next to your boss. Fantastic. I guess I'm the water guy. So. Anybody's thirsty? <laughs> um, yeah, so here we switch to, we're defining a map, and we are in code mode, but we want to switch to data mode so that foo will be a string, number three. Baz will be, oh, we're going to switch back to code mode, the square root of four squared plus one plus eight minus one, which of course equals four. Um, we have the key boo and just uh, a normal sequence, but if we want to get out of that sequence and double two, 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 then we would have to use bang here because you can't, there's no, can't use a double colon there. Um, this is something interesting just for a YAML thing that I don't know how many people know this, but you can split only double quoted strings with a backslash. If you have a, like a really long URL and it's running way off, I mean, I format everything 80 columns if possible, and so, um, and I think Go people, you know, 100, 120, isn't that right? That's what I've heard. There's different camps. But um, yeah, this is a great trick just in YAML, any YAML, to use double quotes on the scaler and then use backslashes. And you won't have any space when it joins the lines. Now, I define this thing. This is a big JSON file of names on the web. I can curl that down, load it with JSON, shuffle everything, and take the first five, which is cool and really pretty tight. Um, and here we have our final data document that we want to define. So we have a normal key, a normal value. Um, <clears throat> we have data, and we're going to call merge on that first map, that plane map we defined. Uh, the second map that's defined up above, map two, is a variable. So we use bang to, to turn this into code so that it was a variable to get it. Um, the number is going to be 21 times 2, whatever that is. Um, <clears throat> and friends will be uh, our group of friends. So let's see what happens with this when we load it. There we go. Alameda, Pet, Tierza, Brittany, and Faye. They all seem to probably have similar pronouns. Um, Shirley, Cassandra, Doris, Mallory, Roxy. But who knows? Um, and 
the minus C flag will compile this file, which is a, it seems weird, but this, any code or data file is, compiles to closure, and this is what it looks like. Um, yeah, so that's the closure that it feeds to the closure runtime to evaluate that and return the response. Any questions on that? Did that make sense? Yes, got a question. Like YQ and JQ? Oops, Start sorry. over again. Yeah. Uh, do you see YAML script being a replacement for tools like YQ or JQ? Like, could you pipe uh, a document yes. to YAML script? Yep. Um, I think I've already done it once. And yeah, I'm actually, I mean, YQ looks really interesting. I need to read through and steal what I can, you know? I mean, I, I, I don't tell anybody to use YAML instead of anything. I mean, you know, JSON it. If you love it, use it. But um, yeah, I, I'm going to look at things and make YAML script better, because if you're going to use it, I want it to be great. Uh, quick question here. Yeah. There's a whole lot of tools that use um, YAML parsers all throughout the ecosystem. And I was curious if you had a sense of basically how much of a lift it would be for those existing YAML tools to uh, adopt the ability to parse YAML script and, and execute it, like so you could use YAML script basically as your templating um, and, and get all these benefits. That, that comes later in the talk, but uh, I'll give a sneak preview. Yeah, so YAML is bound to 42 languages, but we only have 10 done so far. I always like to pick 42 if it's a good number. And um, <clears throat> yeah, we have, so Go has a binding that you can use instead of the Go loader. You can use, and it, you can support YAML script or not. Um, any language, Ruby, Python, blah, blah, blah. Um, Rust. Thanks. You bet. Um, yeah, so with one liners, I'm like, well, you can't type bang YAML script v0 in front of every one liner. That's nonsense. So um, it automatically will, with minus e there, will insert that. Unless you use the minus m flag, um, it defaults to code. So that's the same. But if we do this, we just get two uh, scalar values because we were in bear mode. In data mode, well, say is going to be a string, but look, we use the double colon, so it should be 42. Yep, OK. And then let's do the same thing, show it in JSON. Let's show it in YAML, et cetera. So there you go. Um, I, I wanted to show a few interesting dot chains and how I, so I was talking with somebody that like, I think Troy actually, you told me, right? She's like, you know, I mean, a lot of people these days like go because there's one way to do things or, you know, certain languages have a one way to do thing. Um, I've always been a diversity guy. And so there's a lot, like Closure has pretty much one way to do most things. I mean, you, there's different functions you can call, but you're all gonna, you're gonna code them the same way because it's a Lisp and that's the nature of Lisp. Um, YAML script, there's at least a dozen ways to do anything. And maybe there'll be a YS fumped sometime to give you the best style. Um, maybe one of you will contribute it. That would be great. But yeah, look, we're going to take the, the environment, pull out a key user, that would be me, and we're capitalize the first later, letter, and let's just see what happens. Ingi wants to talk about YAML. That's me. Ingi's my username, of course. Um, and UC1 is capitalized the first letter. Um, here, notice the, the double colon or double parenthesis here. I'm like, eh, that shows up a lot. So if you put a colon in front, it means no arguments. Call that with no arguments. It just makes um, expressions like this cleaner. Um, <clears throat> here, let's see what happens here. So we took this as a separate statement, and then we used um, string arithmetic and added these two strings together. So the plus is, is uh, polymorphic with mappings, arrays, all, all kinds of data types. Um, and other operators are as well. Now let's run this one. Oh, we got an error. Well, what happened? That's invalid YAML. Can anybody see why? Well, we had a string, and it ends here. So what's this stuff? That's not allowed, right? But we can make this whole thing an unquoted string just by putting a minus in front. Now, 
This double quote is just another character, and this is just an unquoted plain scalar, as we say in YAML speak. <clears throat> and we can do interpolation. So the version variable was lying around, so I used that. So YAML script version 0 0.184 wants to talk about YAML. Yeah. Um, OK, so now I'm going to start. I'm going to show you something that's probably useful. <laughs> Um, like a, a way to, it's not a Kubernetes, but it, it's a way for dealing with the wall of YAML, as the, the case on it people used to say. Um, how do you refactor YAML to be maintainable? And let's take a look. So there's a <clears throat> VS Code. Actually, we're in VS Code right now. I'm just using the terminal of VS Code. There's my editors. Um, yeah, I wrote all of YAML script in Calva in Clojure, and it's the best Clojure option for, you either use Emacs, and I'm not going back, <laughs> or use uh, uh, Clojure, in, uh, uh, Calva in, in VS Code. Um, it's written by a guy named Peter Stromberg, who's he's one of these guys who had a, you know, like without him, there's a certain guy that introduced the two of us without him. I actually met him um, 16 years later, and we had lunch, that wrote that introduction between me and Clark. And without him, YAML wouldn't exist. Without Peter, YAML scripts might not exist, because it was just a side project. And then he pulled me into the closure. After I gave my first talk, he saw it, pulled me into the closure community, showed me the right tools. And I'm like, oh, this is doable in a few weeks. And now, you know, you know 15 months later, it's, do it's done. It's working. So. Um, programmers, right? So, yeah, but Peter's great. So let's take a look at his last April's Circle CI YAML file. It's 600 and some lines. It has nine, uh, you know, large bash scripts in it. There's a, this is a command, right? It's actually a bash script. It's not lintable. Um, so I wanted to break this apart and make it nice. What I did was break it into 37 small files um, that produce the same original file. Um, they're all small. Uh, there's tw there were 21 small YAML files. The nine bash scripts are now in files that end with .bash and a bin uh, directory that, are, that have a linter added to them that check them. I found a dozen bugs in his bash this way, fixed them for him. So it's not the original YAML that he started with. It's the better YAML that does what he wanted it to. Um, and added a make file that just, you know, so you can do a make build and it will produce this original thing. Um, let's take a look at it. Okay, so down here, this is the big enormous thing, you know, that gets produced by it. That's more or less what he started with. Um, but this is the file, this is the main file that gets built and then pulls in all the other things. Um, and I, I added a lot of comments and stuff. These are the different, you know, I just made up these variables. These were jobs, so I said this is, these are the jobs you're going to have to render. Um, yeah, and that's it. It's like 75 lines. Um, I made a library of helper functions that were just, you know, I, I saw the repetitiveness in the code and it's like, oh, this will make it not repetitive. It's just refactoring. It's like refactoring any piece of code, right? I actually talked to somebody, and it was an interesting conversation. He's like, yeah, but when you split it all out, then it's kind of hard for new people to read it or to understand it, you know, because all in one file, at least you can read through the whole thing. I'm like, that's fair. Um, but at least in Python, if you break it out and you make it all nice and dry, you have to still have to look in 37 files. With YAML, you can still look at, you lose the comments, and hopefully YAML script can address that in a future release where comments are preserved. You know, I, I want to do that. It's just not an easy thing to do uh, for YAML with a data model. Anyway, does that kind of make sense? Good enough? Move on? See so how we're doing for time. So that's like a general strategy for kind of dealing with any big, unwieldy YAML. Um, and are there questions? Okay. 
You're going to miss the good one. Um, yeah, so this, you could use this for anything. Um, someday, uh, you know, since there are loaders for any language, I suspect that bigger companies will start supporting YAML script, but you can do it without them. You could do it for GH, GHA, GitHub Actions, and, um, you know, any, any big YAML consumers, Ansible. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So, and basically, you know, your make file looks like that. Make build converts, just runs it through YS minus Y. That's it at the end, if you do it right. Okay, this is the big one, using YAML script and Helm charts. So, <clears throat> where would, sorry, you know, I did wrote some of these this morning. I think this was the last one that I really concentrated on, so. What would YS hook into Helm? I don't even know that sentence. No, oh, that does make sense. Where would YAML script hook into Helm the Helm YAML flow? How do I get YAML script into Helm? Um, and so I, I took a look a, a few weeks ago. I'm like, conference-driven development, got to really dig into this. And I generated a Helm chart, and the, I saw the chart YAML and the values YAML are, the, they're valid YAML, so that's cool. Um, but the templates have Go templating in and are definitely not valid YAML, so I'm going to have to figure out where, at what point in the processing um, do I do my thing? So let's create a chart. We created a chart. Let's look at that chart. So those are the files in the, in the chart. The important ones are the, that we care about are the chart YAML, the values YAML, and then the three, the deployment YAML, service account and service. So <clears throat> let's see if they're valid YAML. Yep, the chart is. The values is, and the deployment YAML is not. Okay, so I'm gonna keep going on this. Um, now let's actually run Helm template and see what it spits out, and is that valid YAML? So, and it is valid YAML. So I'm like, okay, that's good. So it looks like I need to hook in sometime after that render, and then. Um, I met with one of the Helm guys, and he's like, oh, yeah, there's a post renderer. And I'm like, oh, perfect. So um, that's the solution at the moment. Let's, let's take a look. OK, so what happens if we put YAML script code in templates? So here I'm going to actually have to type a little. So I'm going to say bang YAML script slash v0, put it in data mode. OK. And I'm OK with Vim, so I can use that. Do it. Uh, actually, I already know that it can't go above that Go templating. So in the essence of time, I'm going to put it there. OK. So now we have YAML script, which is not valid YAML, in this Helm chart. What's going to happen? And just for a heck of it, let's throw in a comment. Um, hi there. OK because I know that template comes first when I use some template. So look, good news. It left my YAML script alone. It left everything alone. It, um, it left the, the comment into there. Um, it, left the, it did multiple <clears throat> documents, the ones I wanted, and it, it kept the YAML script tag for all of those. OK, so now we're getting somewhere. Um, what if we? Do that same thing, but we'll run it through YAML script and then compare to see if it was the same as before. So um, this, now the tags have gone away because we ran it through YAML script. It evaluated everything it needed to, and it spit out YAML because we asked it to with, with the minus Y flag. And the minus S flag says, by default, I said it spits out the last document. Uh, minus S, the, you know, could have been minus Y, minus S here, but it, you can combine those, um, spits out all three of those documents that were fed into it. Let's do the diff between them. And there's no differences. Great. So I oh, yeah. hold that applause, man, because this is going to blow you away. Um, and I'm going to hold on for questions after this next one. So 
let's put some YAML script into the templates. Um, actually, it's the next slide that's going to really get you. But um, so I put some YAML script into a deployment YS, and we're going to copy that into the chart. It's done, and I'm going to put this helpers file that I that it uses into the templates directory as well. And these, here's what I did. Um, I added the tag at the top, and I told this, let's spread that out, deployment YAML file to use this helpers file, which just defines some variables and functions. You know, in Helm templates, who uses Helm? OK, good. <laughs> I was worried that you know, maybe nobody would use Helm. There's other stuff. Um, but you have charts, values, and releases that are your main like, data sources, right? So in YAML script, well, these are just normal YAML files, so I can load them into variables. And this, I had to do a little trick. I actually had to render a little tiny three-line template that told the Go template to spit out the value of release as YAML so then I could rank it back in. Anyway, um, but after that, um, there wasn't a trunk value. Um, I looked in the helpers file from Go templating, and I basically just ported this whole thing to YAML script. That's the, the for a Helm create, that's the underscore helpers file becomes, you know, this is the port of that. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so I ignore the little shenanigans, but at the end, all that YAML scripts uh, became the normal thing uh, that we would have gotten with the, with the Go templates. Um, and see, there's no differences between using YAML script or using the other thing if you do it right. Yeah. All right, all right, all right. I'll take it. But, <laughs> okay. Introducing Helmwise. So I wanted to show this to Matt Farina from the Helm 4 team. Um, Troy, Troy knows him. And actually, I used to work with him, but we didn't cross paths when we all worked together. Uh, so I just reached out. He's, are you here, Matt? I can't really see. He's not. Um, but he's lovely, and he's doing a great job with Helm. Um, how many people know Matt? I mean, he's, he's a good guy. Um, yeah, and he took, took a look at this, told me what direction to go, and I'm like, okay. And he's like, he told me, oh, there's a, I'm like, do you guys meet? Because I know you're doing Helm 4 soon. And he's like, yeah, we meet tomorrow. I'm like, can I join? And I joined, and I showed it to the whole team. And I heard the, I heard something from them that was like music to my ears. They're like, yeah, we never really liked that Go templating. And then I, I, I talked, I, Talk to a bunch of people here, and I haven't found who loves Go templating. Well, all right, maybe you're afraid to admit it because you don't want to be the only one. But somebody, I don't know, somebody probably likes it. Anybody from HashiCorp? Maybe. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <clears throat> okay. So you can use Helmwise. It's, oh, let's take a look at this repo. It's under the Cubewise <laughs> organization. So I made a, a Cubewise GitHub organization to put Kubernetes YAML script stuff under. So I'm hoping more stuff will show up here, including you know if you come up with something cool, it's, we can add it here so it gets publicized. Um, but the basic deal is setting it up. Um, you run your command like this with a post renderer now, um, and you say post renderer equals Helmwise. Um, you need YAML one point. 0.184, which shipped this morning, um, or higher. Um, you need to put the Helmwise binary, which is a bash script at the moment, into your path. And then you need to copy two files into your templates directory of your chart. And then you're good. Um, and you can, re you can replace as much or as little of the Go templating as you want. I mean, if you have a massive thing and you're like, oh, I know YAML script does this thing, but I don't want to convert my whole chart to YAML script yet, I and mean, I have work to do, you can just use zero lines or one line or, you know, you can replace all of it. So I think that's great. And that, for me, starting back, back to your question, what drives you? And, I don't know if she's still here, but um, oh, um, yeah, I, I knew I can't ask people to change to my thing. I never do that. It's just like make something that works with the ecosystem, but make the ecosystem better. So. Um, yeah, let's try it out. Oh, I'm, just, just before we even look at it, let's just, I wrote another YAML script program that compares files side by side because 
it's a little easier than reading a, di well, I don't know if it is, because it's a gist, and just for some reason has a limitation on table width that you can't work around. Um, at least nobody thinks you can. Maybe there's some hacker that could do it. So um, here's the helpers file that we're talking about. There's the YAML script on this side and then the, the Go templating version on this side. Whatever you like better is your choice, but I know what I like better. Um, but the templates is where it starts to really shine. So there's the service account template, the stock one ported to YAML script. Um, here's the service, and it, the deployment one just really tightens it up. I mean, hopefully you can see that it's just a lot nicer. It's all YAML. You can lint it with YAML, um, but it does exactly the same thing. So you can clap now. <laughs> And here's a little demo of Helmwise. So let's clone the repo. Done. Let's um, make a new chart. Let's, oh, no. What's this going to do? Make Helmwise. Oh, I'm going to run the, the test suite inside this new repo that I got. So I just cloned Helmwise. I can do make minus C, which CDs into the directory, make test. And let's see what it did. So it created a chart called a chart. It copied two templates, like I said. Um, and it did Helm stall. It did Helm install with the post renderer, and then it re installed the chart. So that worked. Um, that's it. I mean, boom. I added some new features to Vroom, so my slide, uh, I'm still getting used to it. <clears throat> OK, so let's create a new Helm chart. We did it. Um, let's copy those files over. Um, from Helm YS or Helm YS, and I pre-wrote some templates that, that are all YAML script converted, except for one of them, and then we can convert that ourselves. Um, kind of see how that works. So it's more it's supposed to be a tutorial, and see how we're doing on time. Yeah, we're doing good. Um, so we'll show that. So um, yeah, and now let's do an install. Make sure it works. And these are the output files that if you set environment variables, it will actually, so this is what came into the post renderer. And you could see, um, that there's the YAML script down in here. I actually, there's no tags, there's no, and I'll show why in a second, there's no bang YAML script at the top. So how's this gonna work? But I do call functions that, I mean, I have the double colon, this is obviously YAML script. Um, it's, there's no Go templating in here, so let's see what's happening. Let's, so then there's the middle section where I actually walk through this and I just put in the, so you can either put the tags in yourself or I thought, why should you have to do that? I'll put them in for you. It's, just, it's always the same. And I'll add a use helpers to the top because that helper library is gonna be needed to use. And that helpers library that you install, that's yours to extend. That's just what's needed for a, a default chart. But you need, you know, you can add whatever you want into there. And, and then this is the output. There's no YAML script left. This is the final thing that the Go templates would have produced. So um, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is copy this command, the one that installs a template, or a chart, rather. And then this is the one I didn't convert. And let's kind of convert it. So um, since it was hard for me to remember, everything. <laughs> I, I cheated and I, uh, so let's, the name is going to become, where's the name? Service account name. So let's do that first. So service account name is defined in helpers. And I'm going to say service account name. Now, it should be in my history here. Let's see if it works. It does not work. And the reason it doesn't work is because we didn't use the double colon, which we needed to make it a variable, now it works. Um, let's take the labels, which I know is common labels, function call, common dash labels. Let's parens at the end, do that. It doesn't work because I forgot again the double colon to switch to code mode. And we should get rid of this Go templating because it's no longer necessary. So no n indents. I, I know you love n indents, but <laughs> um, yeah, that works. And then this is the. This is the big one. This is one, two, three, four lines. 
Let's get rid of those and replace them with, I'm just gonna copy them from over here. You could, either, you could do this in one or two lines, but since the first one was kinda long, um, you could have put that value up on the next line, on the first line, so it could be one or two lines. Let's yank that. And I think we put it here, but let's see. I think so, let's see what happens. Yep, that works. And I'm gonna do the final one. This one's easy because it's just literally um, uses the same syntax as the Go without the, the curly braces and without the front dot. Um, that's valid YAML script and we run it and it doesn't work because I always forget the double comma. So, there, so that works. Now we're 100% pure YAML. What does that mean? It means that we can run YAML lint on it. So we get some errors. Oh, it wants a minus, uh, a header thing. And this is configable if you don't, you know, with YAML lint, but YAML lint's not my thing, but, um, oops, sorry. Um, bang, lint it, and we have this one error. What's that? Oh, indentation. I thought it would be kind of cool to not have to indent, you know. Anyway, so you could probably configure it to be okay with this, but let's try it now. Um, sorry. Yes. And now we have a clean lint. So, you know, we, if you are into linting YAML, now you can do it on your templates if you want to. Yeah, so that's a, a full conversion from, um, from Helm charts. Uh, Go templating to YAML script using in Helm YS. So where's this thing go? What's the state of it? Um, I would say that this week, since I wrote it a week ago, it's a proof of concept. I wouldn't put it into production, um, but maybe by Christmas, yeah? So if you guys try it out, it, that would be really helpful. Tell, tell me what don't, doesn't work. I already know a couple things that I need to address uh, with the team, and um, but mostly it works. So if I could get feedback from you all, that would be appreciated. Um, yeah. Uh, let's take questions on that. Somebody has to have a question on this. Huh? Yeah. Synta oh, the syntax highlighting. Great question. Um, yeah, I was going to point out that the, in the beginning that about this talk, the syntax highlighting is going to be off because YAML syntax highlighting in general has always been bad. I haven't found a good one. If you know of a good one, please contact me. You do? I don't. Oh, okay. Um, but the great news is if you're a, a VS Code user, we just need to write an LSP server, and the compiler, the way it works, is set up to do that pretty, pretty easily. So um, expect that's on the roadmap. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, okay. So here's a list of the shared libraries. The closure core is massive, and it, almost anything you want to do for general programming is available for you there. It's somewhere between 650 and 750 functions. I forget. Um, the closure string library is in there, and if you use closure, you have to prefix it with the namespace, I just made it all available from the top level namespace because those are really useful functions. So you don't have to say stir slash join, you can just say join, something like that. Um, math functions, and then I added the YAML script standard library, you know, things like you saw with curl or, um, or load. Load is actually a closure thing, so I shadowed that, and then I made another namespace. If you really need the closure load, which nobody does, or the closure compiled. They're, I usually only shadowed things that were not really that popular in closure, but they're accessible from YAML script. Um, and then there's stuff to reach out to the, uh, there's a whole file system uh, stuff that's actually exposed through the standard library. So you don't really, you don't have to require all these things. They're just kind of baked in. Like FS is the namespace for using the FS functions. You don't have to do a require and use the full namespace and all that kind of thing, if you don't want to. Um, IPC is supported and HTTP is supported. Um, there's a lot more that I want to add. It's just time, right? So the async stuff is coming soon, and that's important. Any questions on the libraries? Cool. Um, OK, so this is a superpower of YAML script. It's pulling in external data. I'm going to pull in from four different places here. Let's take a look. OK, so here is something I did last spring. There's the guy who wrote the technology that supports all of this is uh, the project's called Babashka, and it's 
Mikael de Borkent um, from the Netherlands, I believe, um, he's one of the powerhouses of Clojure, and he wrote the runtime backend called SCI, Small Clojure Interpreter, that YAMLScript's built over. If you know Babashka, like, YAMLScript is a, like, it's kind of a younger um, YAML syntax version of that. Uh, it, it just from a technical perspective, that's how it works. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, and then, so I pulled in this external module that actually, this thing will install it the first time it's run off the web, or you can pre-install it. Um, here's a long URL that I split again, and I use the curl command that we already saw. Um, and then here I'm gonna load another YAML file, which is something that you're gonna wanna do a lot, and you just use the load function. And then you can use it within the data, you just use the equals colon um, anywhere, and it works. So, and here we, we're doing an SQL query. This is kind of a fake query because it's not hitting a database, but it's still valid SQL that it's evaluating. Um, it's adding 41 plus one and returning it as a row of sum. So um, uh, let's see what ha how it works. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. So there we go, we got our friends and our enemies. I don't know if you saw how enemies worked. Uh, enemies was kind of the cool one. So name three will shuffle and take three names. Then I take another three names and I zip them, so that's the first and last names. And then I turn it into a set of arrays and then map over those arrays and join the elements. And so I get like a double name. So that's kind of cute, right? So um, let's run it again. Yeah, so my, you know, I. I name my friends by their first name, but my enemies by full name. So you know who you are, Melissa Moreau. <laughs> um, this address was pulled out of the original YAML spec um, example thing that I downloaded to disk and used the load on. And, um, and this is the result of our SQL query down here. Um, we got a row of sum, and then we pulled the data out of that, and it just came up with 42. So, Um, JSON, same thing. L is just load, and that gives tight JSON. And we can pipe that into JQ if we want, right? So, cool. Questions? No. Really? Okay. You can compile YAML script programs to binary executable, I just realized since I had this tool chain that compiled Clojure to, and to, the whole YS is written in Clojure and it compiles to a native binary, I'm like, why don't I just let the people who write their programs do that as well? Um, and so let's try it out. We'll take 99 charts of YAML and make an ELF binary on the Linux system. Um, you know, And it takes a long time. Uh, this is actually fake. I wrote a script that like when it saw this line, it would just print this. It actually takes mm, one to two minutes um, because it's actually analyzing all of that jar Java stuff and it's, it's a wicked technology. It really does a lot. Um, but it produces, so that's a three millisecond run compared to if you were on it with YS is a 12 millisecond run. I mean, it's a tiny script, but you can see it is faster. Um, the source code is hidden, so it's a good way to distribute things, whatever. And it's easy to do. So it takes a little time, but um, might be worth it for you. Any questions on that? Nope. Um, installing YAML script is, there's a page of a bunch of ways to do it. The easiest way is to curl yamlscript.org slash install and pipe it to bash. And let's, I'm gonna just run it because it actually installs two things. Um, it installs YS command, which we've seen, and libyamlscript.so, which is needed for um, bindings in different languages. So you can use brew install, um, or you can read the install page for other ways. You can build it yourself quite easily. Actually, the build system is cool because it needs Java and all this stuff, but you don't need to install Java. It actually just curls a few things and sets a couple environment variables in temp. And so you just, if you have make, curl, and bash on your system, I think that's all you need to build YAML script from the repo. It's just, grabs its dependencies in slash temp and, and does it. Um, yeah, so back, who, who asked the question about using YAML as a loader in, in I, 
Um, so this is your slide. <laughs> so um, it works as a full YAML 1.2 loader. Um, report any bugs, but um, for all languages that support FFI, so anything that can bind to this shared library, it's good to go. Um, and I have it for 10 languages. Let's see what those are. So, and some of these, I just knew people who knew them. So like uh, Julia is Clark Evans, the other YAML guy's favorite language. Um, and so I just kind of did that um, one for him. But I, I can't even remember if I did that one. I did the Python one, and I said, let everybody else copy off of that. So if there's a language that you want, just copy off of one of these other languages that you know and um, submit a PR. They should all be part of the, the mono repo. It's one big mono repo, because I ship all of the bindings. And, like last night when I released YAML script, I released all of the new versions of these bindings, because it's a language is, is evolving rapidly. Um, we're not at a stability thing where you can use an old SO. Um, yeah. So the cool thing about this is this works the same in every language. So now you have, if, and if I add a dumper to this, this is a complete um, YAML implementation. And nobody really asked or got excited when I said, we're changing YAML next year. Well, how do you do that? Because if you change the spec, you got to wait for everybody to make implementations unless you do them all yourself, because they're easy, because there's a binding, and it's just a few lines of native code. Yeah? Yeah? Could work. Um, any follow-up questions there? Almost done here. Um, here's a little example of, here's a YAML file. It was that one from the spec that I was showing. It's, you know, it's, been there since 2000, whatever. And, um, and here's a Python program that uses PyYAML, the normal YAML loader, to load that. Um, so if I run that, it's going to print JSON out. And I think it's, okay. yeah. Um, I can do the same thing in YAML script. So there's the YAML script program that uses, instead of uh, PyYAML, it uses YAML script. You can pip install YAML script. You can go get YAML script. You can uh, gem install YAML script. You can <laughs> uh, npm install YAML script, blah, 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 um, whatever language is supported. It's just a normal install. Um, um, and I want to get it to where the, the, the installers actually install the, the shared library, but um, I haven't figured that. So right now, you also have to install the shared library, but it's, that's really easy. So. Um, yeah, and then no differences. Yeah, so what I just showed you there, you can do in Go or whatever the language is, if it has a binding, and if it doesn't, and you really like that language, submit a binding. Um, so the YAML script compiler is just a loader. Like, people say parsing YAML, and they think that means taking YAML and turning it into memory objects. That's not what YAML calls parsing. YAML Parsing is one stage of seven of what we call load, which is the whole process of taking it. You actually read the YAML, convert it into code points, that's the, and then you lex that, and then you parse that, and then you compose that into a tree, and then you internally assign tags, which are needed by the constructor to, to look up functions that turn those native language functions. So it's, it's a stack. Um, I wrote a, a thing, because it helps me debug YAML script all the time. Um, if you add the minus D flag to any minus C flag where you compile, this is the ROT13 program. Um, here's the parse step. That's the first step. And I use an off the shelf, it's called a snake, snake YAML from Java because writing a YAML parser is a big task. And I wasn't going to take that on for writing YAML script. Um, I actually, there's a, one written in C by my fr a friend from um, Portugal, and it's called Rapid YAML. And it's the world's fastest YAML parser. And that will likely uh, be replacing Snake YAML at some point. But Snake worked right off, right off the shelf. And that's why all YAML script has to be valid YAML, because it's not going to get through Snake YAML if it's not. Um, I take that. I compose it into a tree. I add tags here. And then I do something different. I have to look at the expression parts of the code thing and actually do a parse on that. Then I have a transformation stage where I, I, um, it's kind of like a macro stage, if you know Lisp, um, where things are switched around in the AST. The final thing is the construct. And this produces the final AST, which then you hand to the printer. And then it just prints out closure code. So this is 
a closure AST is, is what the const, uh, constructor produces. And so it's kind of cool. You can actually see what's happening very clearly. And you can find bugs. Like if you find a bug, you could probably solve it yourself and report it. You're like, yeah, it's, you're doing this in here, at the, in this stage, in the build stage or whatever. Um, I won't get into this too much, but anchors and I won't run all those, but um, anchors and aliases, it was interesting. I didn't add support for those right away. It was a, um, probably six months in, and I'm like, well, I got to do this. Conf there's a conference coming up, and I'm like, they're going to want it. Um, the, it. They actually compile the function calls. So when you get to an anchor, it's, uh, it, there's a function that stores it into a, uh, uh, an anchor table. And then when you get to the alias function, it looks it up by that name, and if it doesn't exist, it errors out. Um, yeah, so that's how that works. If you compile, oh yeah, so we just compile that, and you can see they're weirdly named functions. They kind of look like the names. It's underscore and is the anchor function, and underscore star is the, you know, so those are function calls there. That This stores the value of this, and this looks it up under the name x. All right, take one minute to learn. <laughs> this is kind of a joke, but um, Lisp and closure in one minute. So it's just all parens. The first thing in any paren is a function call. Here we define a function. Oh, let is going to define some local variables. We have an itvec set to an empty array. Step is to one. We're going to loop over these things, starting with these bindings. The way loop everything, closure is a functional programming language. And the, it compiles to the JVM, and the JVM does not have tail call rec um, optimization in its yet. So Ritchicki decided that he had to have this recur thing where you actually, it's basically a go-to to the top that you put in an if statement. If current is greater than end, then return the result, else recur with these values for current and for result. It's a little wonky, but that's the way it is. Um, and there's, some, there's other looping structures within Closure and, and YAML scripts as well. Here we define a main function. Or, um, and to get a default of these two things, we actually have to define three function bodies. This one that actually does the work, this one that takes one parameter but calls it with the starting number one, and then whatever you passed in, and then just calls this function. And this one that takes these two values because you didn't pass it anything. And if you pass it three values, there's no function to support that, so you get an error. And then down at the bottom, you have to uh, call that main function with star command line arguments, which I hate. <laughs> that's, that's how you access and closure um, the command line arguments. So now you know Lisp and closure. Um, and BB is that Babashka thing. It's just a super fast startup time of, um, of the, you don't have to start up a JVM every time you run a program. So that's going to print all the even numbers between 1 and 100. And this will print the even numbers between 21 and 30. You know, it's a stupid program. Actually, YAML LLM generated that program for me, to be honest. And that doesn't return anything because the first number is higher than the second numbers. Um, so this is learning. This is the last slide, the last technical slide. Um, YAML script, as we know, compiles to closure. There it is. There's some YAML script that just compiled to closure. Um, if we have some closure, and there's a lot of closure out there, one good way to learn it, like take a Rosetta code example or, some, or an exercise example sometimes, and then work backwards. Um, so we start with here. And what we're going to do is, okay. ys percent. We're going to run this program. And it doesn't do anything because it's actually invalid. So I'm going to go to the next version of this. Here, I added the script at the top, which was needed to do anything um, and have any code in it. And then I turned the top level functions into mapping pairs, where I put the defin and the name and the args as the key, and the rest of the body as the value. So it's, it's, a, it's a blunt hack, but let's see if it works. Yeah, it does. OK, so now we're valid YAML script. This is valid YAML script. Um, let's go to the next. Oh, and I was going to. Go back to this one. 
I left myself with some tasks to do. Let's just do one of these tasks. We're going to say, let's change these lets to initvec um, equals colon. This is where things can go wrong, but we're already through it, so I'm feeling good. OK, and then we have to make this a key as well. Let's do loop. So plain keys need to be on one line in YAML. There's a way to make a multi-line, and I want to show that today. But uh, let's do this and see if it still works. Um, right, the problem is I don't allow I don't allow sequences like the dashes or these um, curly braces or square brackets in code mode. So you have to put a minus in there to turn it into a plain scalar, and now it should be valid. Oh, and the, since I took out a paren at the beginning, I got to take out a paren at the end. Um, two parens. Now we're good. OK, it works. We're back. And I finished up this refactoring here. And so I continue. What's the next thing? It says um, refactor these. That's just too much work. But um, let's do this one. Use. So if I take this do all out, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to take off that last paren. It's going to be valid, but it's going to print nothing. That's because this is a lazy sequence. And like um, in Clojure, it's a functional language. You can have an infinite sequence. And they're really quite useful. But they're sometimes getting away when you try to print you're using a for loop that returns a lazy sequence. I can't fully explain it, but uh, it's not going to print anything. So I'm like, well, that's not going to fly for YAML script. We need a version of for, and I couldn't change for, so I made each. So do all, that do all wrapper made it um, eager instead of lazy, I think is the term you would use. And so it did print. So hopefully, if I do this and take off the last thing, Actually, if I do this, it won't work because it's going to say you use these square brackets. But one thing you can do is take this parameter, this first parameter, and put it on the key side. And now it works. That's cool. OK. And um, we can combine these two into one. We can, um, I was like, well, YAML script doesn't really need these. I know that loop is always going to need the square brackets, so I'll, be, I'll help you out there. Um, same with the if and if statements. I'm like, if you, it adds the parens for you, trust me. And uh, let's do that. Still works. There's some more to do, but I won't do it. Um, OK, so change. Right, so this is the one kind of cool thing. Um, where do we have? So I'm not seeing an example of what I'm asking you to do. I think it's like already done. <laughs> and I think this is the last one. So this is the YAML script version of what we started with. And it's, it's um, wait, is it? Yeah, it is. I actually could have made it a lot cleaner. I just didn't do that. So here's compared what, with what we started with and what we ended with. And actually, I can't, I can't help it. I'm going to change this. Uh, we can get rid of all this junk by just saying x equals 1. Oh, and I didn't say I could put a comma here, but commas are white space completely in code mode and in closure. Commas, you can use them anywhere. It's, you know, I could put three commas here, no problem. Um, y equals 100. And it's going to generate the same code. I don't need these function calls anymore. Um, I don't need this anymore. Is this? Um, this was called six, so let's, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, let's try running it. And it works. Cool. I have one more minute, but um, this is kind of important. Let me just, so here's some web resources. You can look that up on the web. What's next for YAML script? Um, I said a lot of this. I'm going to be blogging a lot more at yamlscript.org.blog. I haven't had time to blog, but now things, it's ready to start blogging about. There's a lot of stuff that I wanted to blog about, but just didn't have time to. I'm working with the Helm 4 team weekly to make sure that this gets smooth and that it gets into Helm 4 as a first-class citizen. 
Um, here's a roadmap that's gigantic with some of, you can take a look at this of the things, including what you're talking about with syntax highlighting and that kind of thing. And finally, um, it's open source. I work together. I collaborate. So try it out. Use it. I mean, you can, you can write this language, too. Let's do it together. Um, and if you do like it and work for a company that um, has the pockets to fund some of this, because we need more developers. And I took the entire 20, 24 year off to do this, because I knew it was that's I've been working on YAML and tried to solve these problems. This was the answer. So I knew I had to do it regardless. So uh, that's what I did. And I think it was worth it. I didn't think it was worth I was starting to have my doubts until I came here. Uh, but there's, you guys use YAML so much, and there's pain points. And I, I, you know, I connected with, with how that helped you. So that's the end. Um, thank you. I know people like to put the QR code, so I'll leave that up for just another 60 seconds if, I don't know. It's a simple URL, but, all right. Uh, about folks who oh, yeah. Who wants, there's some shirts up here, and I want to give them away. They don't say.